It's time for the long-awaited and long-promised advanced posing guide. But before I get into the nitty-gritty, I want to say that this video covers a lot of different posing topics, and there will be chapters at the bottom of the video for you to find the parts that you are interested in. There will also be a lot of links to the example models that I use in the description below, along with a link to the channel's Discord where there are even more resources for posing and everything else. Bear in mind though that posing is extremely extensive in Hereforge, especially once you get into the unmitigated hellstorm that is horn and tail posing, so I, you know, I do include a little bit of those things in this video, but I have also had to limit myself with how in-depth I can actually go into each subject. But anyway, let's get into it. Now, let's just start by all collectively agreeing that the baseline Heroforge default pose is it's just dog shit. The first thing to understand about posing is all these sliders, right? Everything you can pose has sliders, be it the head, the torso, the hand, and of course some things will have more sliders, like for example the cloak, which has seven sliders over here because you can edit them, and that every one of these sliders represent one point in this cloak, you see? Like if I if I pull all the way up to number one and I twist the cloak, it, it will twist it from the base so the entire cloak moves but if I move down to number six and I twist it here then you see where the cutoff point goes and the same thing of course goes for tails which has 19 which of course is the highest amount of you know posing sliders you can have on one thing but most things will have three for example the neck has three and the torso has three you know you can twist it back and forth and left and right so when it comes to Hereforge in the advanced section by going into pose and then clicking on advanced you know this is the most basic step uh, in advanced, you can change pretty much anything about a character. You know, you can twist this arm in whatever direction you want, you can bend the clavicle around, you can twist the elbow, you can break his arm altogether, you can twist the head in any direction you want, and you know, you can do a lot of cursed stuff. However, the thing that we cannot change, the thing that you always need to bear in mind when you start a new character pose is the leg pose. So these basic poses, you need to view them not as their own poses. Tread lightly is not a pose about someone who's you know, cautiously waving their arms to the, to the right like this. The tread lightly pose is these feet. We cannot edit the leg poses. So. What that means is that all of these poses are just a bunch of legs. You need to try and cut, basically, when, when, when we're choosing these poses, I'm just going to do it like this to simplify. You are choosing a leg pose. You do not have an upper body. You are choosing a pair of legs. And the personality you want to convey with your character is, is going to depend on what initial pose you choose with the legs. For example, what does this tell you? What does this tell you? This right here is someone who looks like they're in the middle of combat, right? You know, they're kind of, they've spread their legs, they're bending their knee, knees, they're trying to keep balance because they're fighting someone over here. By far the most common mistake that I see with Heroforge posing is that people mismatch the personality of their character's base default leg pose and the personality of their upper body advanced posing. Like if your character is mid-action for example, then that momentum needs to show not just in the character's advanced posing arms and head, but also in the base default pose legs, right? For example, I see a lot of people use this tread lightly pose here for characters who are walking forward, right? But they neglect to look, the, look at the fact that the feet look like they're pushed together and it looks like the character's kind of trembling nervously, you know, they're kind of bumping in like this. It really doesn't sell, you know, your menacing Batman walk if your character looks like he's about to have an anxiety attack from walking on stage with the feet, you know, there's a completely different personality in the face and the upper body and in the feet, and that's just, that's the problem, right? However, contrast the tread lightly pose with the poor Yorick pose, which this is the base default posing, but you look at the difference in these feet, and if I just... And now we have basically the same upper body pose as we had with the trade lightly example, but obviously because the, these feet look much more menacing, the whole like evil Batman walk, it's sold a lot better with these feet. And now the upper body pose actually matches with the leg pose, and that's that's what you're looking for. So to show another quick example, let's say you want to make a charging into battle pose, right? The first thing one might think to do is to pick the energetic run pose up here. And it works, I've used this for characters charging in the past, however the legs are basically, you know, flailing all the way up to Narnia in this pose, and because of that it looks kind of a bit, a little bit too cartoony and jolly, perhaps a bit too much so for a charging character, even if you edit the upper body pose. As you can see, we kind of have this aggression now in the upper body pose just with those slight changes, but the legs are still very, you know, it's very high up, so what I would recommend, honestly, more so than to do this, if you wanted a proper charging pose, would be this, the up, up, and away. And, you know, this is not immediately a run pose, but as you can see, the legs here are much more 
forward momentum, right? So what we can do now... And there you go, with just a few quick on-the-spot edits, we've turned this up, up, and away Superman pose into a proper charging pose, which I would argue is actually a lot more... It looks like this has much more forward momentum than the actual energetic running pose does. And this is the point, you always want to look for how the legs look, not how the pose looks at first glance, you know? Now, what are some general recommendations that I have for posing? Well... Okay, so for starters, I would be careful relying too much on the typical heroic pose. I've, I've said before that I believe it's probably the best of Hero Forge's default poses, and I stick by that, but when it comes to advanced posing, the legs on that pose are often a little bit too stiff, unless you're going for like a really casual pose. And a mistake that I see often is people, they pick this pose, and then they go really crazy with the advanced top body pose after that, which, again, it really doesn't add up with the legs, and then it ends up looking very, very off. Another example off the top of my head would be, you know, stereotypically feminine poses. So, for the most obvious ones, which I use a lot personally, I would recommend using the bridge guard pose, or the contraposto pose, if that's how you pronounce it because both of them have the character leaning on or jutting their hip out and again links to all of these little examples will be in the description below as for traditionally masculine poses there's a lot of these kinds of spread feet poses including on the original tada pose which combined with a more ooga booga strongman looking upper body advance pose can go a long way in achieving the look of a very confident stance when it comes to action poses specifically as i said before it, it always kind of depends on finding the exact right balance and it is hard i get this wrong a lot too myself However, However, something that I found that in most cases, picking the ones where both feet are not solely planted on the ground can help a lot. So, especially when a character is meant to be in some kind of motion, you know, in action. You see, when, when both feet are fully planted into the floor, the character looks quite stationary, almost glued onto the base, if that makes any sense. So, therefore, it helps to pick these ones where at least one of the feet are raised up from the base. Even if the original poses don't add up, you correct that afterwards in advance. Now, honestly, one of the best poses I could recommend overall, not only because it's the best kneeling pose, but also because it works on both casual and high action scenarios, would be the low strike pose. So, it can do the trick as, you know, a rifleman or an archer kneeling and shooting or just aiming. It can work for someone who's injured, tiredly leaning on a spear. It can work for someone who's casually crouching in front of a fireplace. It can work for someone who's dodging dragon fire with a shield. It, it can even work for someone who's in the middle of breakdancing, you know. Point is, it's an extremely versatile pose which somehow manages to look good almost no matter how you do the advanced posing, which means that honestly, you know, Sky Castle deserves some credit on this one. And, you know, <laughs> contrast this with the, the toddler sit, which, you know, looks so stiff no matter what, that if you ever use this one, you never want to crop your screenshot past the knees. And, well, if you are a pro here for user and you like to layer two models, all I can really say is you should absolutely do everything in your physical human power to finish all of the posing before you merge the two characters together, or you are going to have a complete posing nightmare. It's it, it's obviously doable, but god, I honestly I, I cannot stress how much extra time it takes and how weird your layering exploits might suddenly look after you've changed the base pose. Just just don't do this at all if you can avoid it, that's my tip to you. Now, something that I get commented to me a lot about is these little technical things. So the first is, why do I not enable this little red option here? It gives you a clear indicator to toy around with, which might make it easier to pose for some people. I can imagine that if you do Hero Forge on a phone, for example, this is probably a useful option, but for me, it, it really doesn't help. I only really use this with lighting posing, because otherwise I find it's very hard to tell where the invisible little bulb is. Now, the second one is the numerical slider input option. Uh, it's useful, even if I rarely actually type in the numbers. Unfortunately, however, it's pro only. But in, in my opinion, it is only a minor convenience. I, I wouldn't be too bothered not having it if I didn't have pro, so to say. Now, I personally like to split up poses into two different categories. So, 
The first pose would be an idle pose, and it would be something like this. I mean, this is still just a default pose, but it's a character who is, you know, at, at rest. Somebody who is just kind of standing or looking. The other pose, I would say, is an action pose, and that doesn't mean they're in combat necessarily. It means that they're in the middle of doing something. So, for example, having a charge where somebody's screaming at the sky like this, I would call this an action pose. But whether or not you're doing an idle pose or an action pose, the character's personality is what you really want to be conveying whenever you make a pose for a character and without adding the pose you're gonna have a really hard time showing what a character is all about what personality they have i mean you could you could make <laughs> i mean as you see here you can do do all this stuff you can give them the same measurements the same decals the same clothing and everything but if this is the pose you have then it's gonna look silly because the, the pose doesn't convey the character's personality but boom suddenly you slap a pose on and it, it does something and I, I know I'm importing here I know it looks silly but you get the point I'm trying to get across so are they a calm character or an unhinged character do they look down on people are they arrogant or are they friendly do they view others as equals or as beneath them are they controlled in combat or are they a raging berserker lunatic these are the things you kind of want to know about your character before you pose them because that's that's what you will pose them around. Now, it also helps a lot to look at references when you're doing posing in Hereforge. It's very, very easy to forget how certain parts of the human body can base, bend, sorry, based on the action that you're taking. So for example, look at this spear throwing pose, right? When I made this, and this is this is kind of an old model, so don't judge me too much on it, but when I made this, there were a lot of things that I didn't really remember, like the, the specific way that the upper body bends like this, the fact that the entire human body wouldn't be facing forward and pulling the clavicle all the way back on this arm. You, you, you see this clavicle here? This is one of the mistakes I made in my first posing guide, by the way. I recommend that people not use the clavicle too much because it can easily make an arm look kind of twisted, unnatural and almost ghoulish. But in cases like these, it's actually very important that the clavicle is used because if, if we had the clavicle all the, all the way down zero and we were just trying to convey that this character is about to throw, yeah, I mean, this this is like the best we could do. Does this really look like somebody who's about to, you know, throw a javelin in, a, in some kind of competition? No, not really. But if we go back, then you see now the arm is way higher up and it looks like they're about to throw it over their own head, kind of. And that's the entire point. And as a second example, I never finished this character. This was meant to be a character for my post-apocalyptic build. This pose I made of a character who's meant to, you know, be firing a gun. But the thing that I didn't immediately remember is obviously that the butt of the rifle has to slam into the shoulder. So finding a way to pose this character where the, the butt of the rifle is against his shoulder and the other hand can also you know connect with the rifle without looking like it's clipping in here is kind of a balancing act between these two shoulders because obviously if i pull this one back you see if i pull this one back too far the the elbow cannot bend to a point where i can realistically get this rifle into the right place against his elbow it just doesn't really work because then the rifle, rifle is facing this way so this is really the best we can do and also if i had the rifle painting it pointing ahead of him like this and I had the, the character's head like this then this arm would need to bend forever in this direction and it would look like it's kind of clipping into his chest to even be able to hold on to the hand and this again as a reference has helped me a lot because you know I could google on how soldiers tend to sit whilst they're shooting and, and this kind of crouching position whilst they're firing helped a lot and again bending the head down to the point where the eye kind of lines up with the shot all these things matter this gives this this pose has a personality in and of itself and that's what what you kind of need to achieve and references help a lot with that realism as for actual examples in this video i am going to be doing four different examples using two different models an idol and an action pose for both of them i'll be doing a barbarian and a knight two entirely different character archetypes one is going to be unhinged carefree and violent and the other is going to be stoic controlled and professional both will have an idle pose and both will have an action pose and I'll go over the creation of all four of them. So let us start with the barbarian and as you can see I already have this kind of pose it's meant to be kind of like a gladiator character but anyway so we want to start with doing an, uh, an idle pose for this character. I, I, I would love to use something where the character can kind of really slouch as people do when they're relaxed and what I would do for that is let's say we grab a base like this and then we take a stone color quickly and we just fill in the stone there we go. So now when the character is sitting down, we can kind of adjust these. And the body, by the way, the torso has the same logic as the head did, in that it has three different levels here, and we can adjust all of them. So if you want to have a character's 
body turn or their head turn, you start with the highest most because it twists the entire thing. Whereas if you twist the same one down here, you see it twists only the upper body. But if you twist all of them the same way, you twist the entire body, you see, and now she's turning all the way in this direction. But what we're going to do now is we're just going to subtly turn all of them a little bit forward, you see, like this. And by doing that, we kind of make the character look like she's leaning forward. And you can also adjust this by doing the posture. However, the posture has a slightly different effect. I mean, you see what it kind of does. It, 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 you can use it for posing. However, it's, it's, it, it kind of depends on the character. It has a different effect from the other ones. Now, with the arms, we're going to pull these forward. Again, I'm going to pull the clavicle down because I want the character to look relaxed. And I'm going to twist the elbow just high enough and then turn the hand over to make it look like she's kind of resting this knife, not inside her other leg, that would be bad. And then as you can see with the other arm, we're just kind of having it hanging down here and I'm going to make it lean a little bit against a rock here next to her and then I'm also going to... Yeah, that's right, and then we... Just make the actual weapon as well, just loosely resting against the ground like this. Now we're getting a very relaxed, you know, after battle kind of pose here. Again, use the clavicles. The clavicles are really good for expressing emotion in a character's like body. Now the face and the head is obviously very, very important with a character when, when you're doing this kind of pose. So I'm gonna twist this around a little bit using all three of them probably because using all three is generally the best way to make a character look natural. So by posing the base of the neck downwards and then using the lower two to pose her head back upwards, we're kind of making it look like she's looking up towards somebody who's approaching her sitting. And because she's sitting, it makes sense that she would look upwards. And of course, that is also where the eye and the face posing comes in. I mean, if, if we just had the, the defaults here, if she was just staring forward, I mean, this is the death knell of any pose. You know, any, nothing else matters now because she's just staring ahead. It looks like she's traumatized from PTSD. But obviously if we just have her looking horizontally and upwards, that gives the character a lot of personality because now it really looks like she's looking up towards someone who's approaching. And we can also do a lot with the face, the face here. I mean, currently it looks like she's kind of exhausted, you know, she's kind of looking bothered. But if we simply change the face a little bit, we pull up the confused and the cocky and then a little bit of smile, a little bit of snarl. Now it kind of looks like she's laughing, it's something somebody's saying. And there you go, by editing all the things we had available to us, we've edited the hands, we've edited the arms, we've pulled the clavicles down, we've made the elbows very relaxed, we have kind of slouched the body forward a little bit, like somebody does while they're resting. The neck is also very slouched, but the chin is pulled up to make it clear that she's still looking and talking to someone, and voila! We have a casual pose for a very carefree barbarian post battle. Now then, let's do an action pose for the Barbarian. And of course, the Barbarian is going to have a combat pose. It only makes sense. So let's get rid of this stone that she's sitting on. And yeah, see, see, this is the point, you know, the default pose. Oh, that, that was a meowing cat in the background. Give me a second. Yeah, trouble is sorted. Now, where was I? Uh, <laughs> so, uh, th this this pose is the default pose, and you can tell the personality is all gone. It's just, it's vanished. It's dead. It's like Sky Castle tried to make the most boring, pointless. So, what better for a barbarian than like a proper charging pose, right? So, let's do the classic, the up, up, and away. As before, we are going to twist this upper body down somewhat, because we want her to be charging forward. So we're gonna pull it like this, but not too much, because we still kind of want it to be, you know, a forward upper charge, like she's gonna be looking upwards. We pull the head downwards, so maybe what we should do is we pull the upper body down, but the rest of it not so much. Then we're gonna twist the head a little bit like this, and you'll understand why soon because I'm going to be doing the same thing to the actual body. We're going to pull up the snarl a lot, probably all the way, open the mouth a little bit, and now the actual body posing. Now, just as I said before, you got to use all three of them because we're turning her body to the side.
Now, what I did there is quite important. You, you want the head and the eyes to be facing wherever she's running to, even though the rest of the body is kind of preparing for a swing. So now we come again to the clavicles, and this here it's going to be important because now we need to match up this weapon between two different hands, right? So we need to kind of we need to pull her arm down as you would whilst you're preparing for whilst you're kind of dual wielding a big weapon like this. We're going to adjust the grip position to make it look like she's preparing for a really long range swing as well, because she wants to be kind of wielding this thing at the base. Now you can see this quite, doesn't quite add up yet, so I'm going to pull this clavicle back further to make it really look like she's winding up for a proper swing. Now when it comes to stuff like this, where you want to pose on a hand onto another weapon, it kind of depends on what pose it is exactly. If this weapon was going straight into her hand, you would probably want to be using something like the main grip, like the, this one here, where you're, you're leaving a space for the weapon to go through. However, because it's coming at a diagonal, I'm going to use the alternative main grip and just kind of pose it down like this, and it fits almost perfectly. As you can see, it goes right in between the fingers and everything. So there you have, you know, a very basic pose to begin with. It looks like she's charging forward with a hammer. Also, during action poses, it can be worth to sometimes increase the length of an arm, especially if you want to bring emphasis to something like a mid-action swing. In video game animation, this is particularly common, that, that you kind of stretch limbs out in order to put focus on this, and in Hero Forge it can be quite similar as long as you know, just it, it, basically just don't go overboard, don't make a character look elastic and you'll be fine. So this character was meant to be a lot more controlled, right, a lot more stoic and whatnot, so... In order to achieve that, we're going to start by neutralizing his facial expression, and then we're going to pick a base pose. Now, there's a lot of poses we could have. I mean, this would be the one that Hero Forge would probably recommend to you, right? Like, this looks like a typical salute, and sure, it works, it's not too bad, but we're going to do something a little bit different. So, we're going to pick this pose, standing still. Um, that is because these legs are very close together, so they will work well for the pose that we're trying to achieve here. Now, we're going to pull the posture all the way up. It's already all the way up, so that's fine. Then we are going to raise his chin. Actually, we're going to pull his upper body back just a little bit. We're going to go all the way down to the third one, and we're going to turn his upper body back a little bit. That's just to make him look a little bit more high and mighty, you know. And then the head is going to be facing forward. We're going to raise his chin just a little bit, but I'm not going to go too wild on it or it'll be overboard. So we pull his chin up like this. The lowest one especially can be good because that's purely the chin, right? If we're doing it like this, then we're pulling the entire neck around. But if we only raise this lowest one, then we're actually just raising the chin. Then with the eyes, we're going to have them looking downwards because, you know, we want the look of arrogance here. So now we have that established. Already you can kind of get the high and mighty look. So then we're going to pull up the confused on the face because confused... Confused, uh, if it's pulled all the way up, it does look confused. But if confused is used lightly, it only raises the lip a little bit, which makes the character look kind of arrogant. Now, we are going to twist this arm behind his back. So how do you do this in Hero Forge? It starts with the clavicle. Again, we're going to pull the clavicle backwards because we need the arm position to be starting further back. Then we need to twist the elbow inwards, but obviously the elbow is in the wrong place. I'm going to ball the hand up into a fist, and then I'm going to twist the arm using this one. The highest one on the shoulder positioning. So now you can kind of see what we're going for here. I'm going to keep on twisting it like this as far as I can. However, you see the kind of problem here in that I've kind of I've reached my limit, right? So, but as you can see, changing the clavicle can also change where the arm is twisted. So in this case, I might have actually gone too far with the clavicle and then I can actually pull it back. So yeah. I will leave the clavicle somewhere here, which will allow this arm to remain where it is, kind of. And I can also pull this out a little bit to reduce clipping further. Then, of course, I can also edit the hand a little bit, like this. And there we go. Now we have an arm behind his back. However, something you'll often notice when you twist a character's arm behind their back is that the shoulder can look kind of messed up. So, what can we do? We can add another shoulder piece like this one. Okay, we have another shoulder piece. So how do you generally pull shoulders then? Again, I will be very brief on this part. The first thing I tend to do is I pull down the scale to zero. Unless you specifically want a character like from World of Warcraft with gigantic shoulder pads, I almost always pull down this shoulder size to zero because they're always oversized. Then you have two different sections here. You have rotation and position. Now the rotation will twist where the, how the shoulder is facing like this. 
Like, it, it, it twists the shoulder pad itself, whereas the position one changes where the shoulder pad is at. So it pulls it either up or down, it pulls it back or forth, or, you know, inwards or outwards. We're gonna use all of them. And there we go. Now we have a shoulder pad that is positioned kind of perfectly under here. There's no clipping going on and the twisting of the arm is hidden. So it looks just fine behind his back. Now that we have this other arm, this other arm is obviously the glaring problem. So what we're going to do is you can see here, we're pulling the clavicle back ever so slightly and downwards because having the arm pulled back kind of again increases that uh, arrogant look. We have the arm very straightened and the sword is pointing almost in the same direction as his arm is pointing. So there we go, both shoulders are positioned, both arms are positioned, now you kind of you kind of have the pose done however i feel like there's there's more there's different ways we could do this you know like having the sword down like this it it makes the character look a little bit less battle ready and just kind of like he's casually standing there which which works as well you know one of the difficult parts about posing like this is if you have a really long sword or a really long weapon as i do right now you can clip into the floor very easily if you have a relaxed pose where the weapon is downwards now doing a point like this like obviously now we have we, we kind of have a pose down right like we have we have this very arrogant pointing the sword down at someone look everything is kind of fixed however if you want to add something extra to this something that i feel like a lot of people don't use very often it's twisting the body a little bit now this can go a really long way in kind of helping convey personality in different ways so if i twist the body a little bit like this it means that the character isn't fully facing whoever is doing this to and you got to do the same with the head obviously and by doing that, you're you're giving the impression that the, even less of his attention is going towards whatever is going on. Or alternatively, if it's a duelist, it makes sense for duelists to not be facing properly their target because they tend to fight from the side, right? To reveal less of their body and to have greater reach. Well, which way you want to do this kind of depends as well on the base pose. Like in the case of something like this, it might have made more sense to have the legs further apart. So I might tone it down just a little bit have him turned slightly less to the side like these are the things because if i went all like balls to the walls with this right if i twisted him like this suddenly it looks like he's very mid action which is not really what you want so because i chose a very simple you know put together boots i should probably not go too over the top with the whole turning thing now finally there is uh there's this thing. Um, gear posing is generally very simple. Honestly, Hereforge tends to be pretty good at doing it itself. However, these th this thing follows the same rules as the shoulder posing, right? So there's there's position that you can choose where it's at, you know, if it's up or down, if it's back or forward, etc. And then this one just twists it around. So generally with most of these things, it's just positioning them as close to the body as possible. All right, so we have made the second idle pose. Now we need to just make the last action pose. So how exactly are we going to do that? I'm thinking there's a lot of poses you can do for these kind of knights, but I want to make a pose that's kind of popular and it's like the, the, the Jamie Lannister knight stance where you're kind of aiming with your sword. First of all, we need to find a pair of legs that fit and guard. So this pose can be very good for this kind of thing. However, I think I'm going to so I'm going to pick the guard pose and then I'm going to flip it over as I said and now we are going to move this sword into the other hand because we want this hand to be holding it. So, so we want to start by twisting this body a little bit in this direction so we're going to straighten it out a little bit from this perspective. we're gonna pull this arm upwards because this is the one that really matters right so we need the clavicle all the way up this time. Now, of course, as before, we need to post the head, and this time I, I, I want this look of intent. So I'm gonna pull the eyes upwards, like this, like he's facing someone. I'm gonna pull up the snarl. So now this is kind of where it gets difficult because now we need to find a balance where this arm can reach the hilt of the sword, whilst also not looking completely clipped into the body. So we can start by pulling the clavicle a little bit like this. I'm gonna pull it down but also sidewards and then this arm needs to go like this now you can also cheat a little bit here and i can just extend the arm length of this arm just a little bit to give it that extra bit of reach don't go too far though because then people will notice that the arm is stretched and then this arm again needs to come closer maybe
And now we just need to match this hand up here with the actual sword. And this doesn't have to be super exact in my opinion. There you go, now you have this kind of typical soldier's, you know, sword aiming pose. And there's a few different ways you can do this as well. I mean, you could you could continue to twist the body, you could have it like this, you could have it like this, you know, like how much you want to twist the body is kind of up to you. You can also do this thing where instead of having the, the hand on the hilt, if you think that's really difficult, you can actually pull this back and instead pull the clavicle all the way up like this instead of down. And then you use this arm as a kind of lean for the sword because that's also something that was done as far as I know. I'm not, I'm not a medieval expert, but uh, so if I do a loose fist on this arm and I pull it up like this, pull in the elbow a little bit, pull it up again and correct the hand. Now, yeah, you see what I'm going for here. I'm kind of using the, the sword, the, 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 the second arm as a rest for the sword. And this is the third and final iteration I've done on this. And in this case, it's basically just uh, I've pulled the sword closer to the head. So now you can see that the hilt is kind of against his face. But by doing that and by like I, I've pulled this, this elbow close to the face well rather than having it further back. And by doing that, I've given the space for this arm to actually reach the hilt. So now, now the sword hands are kind of perfect. But the, the trade-off for that is that the arm is further clipped into the arm, into the body, sorry, and this shoulder is not as far back. So it, it looks like the sword is being held much closer to the chest this time around. For better or for worse, you know, it's up to you which one you think is coolest, but all, all three of these versions will be in the description below. So there's a lot of things you can do by stacking arms and I kind of go fully in depth on exactly everything you can do because in, in this video because I need to kind of keep to the basics on some of the more advanced topics but the um, using extra arms to clip items into characters or to add extra detail to an arm by, with extra gloves is a very common trick in the Hereforged community. So you can see that this arm that I'm messing around with here is holding a medal, right? So to show you how you do this from the start, let me just remove that arm altogether and the medal it's holding. So, you have your character here, you feel like the, this, this paladin is pretty much ready, but you want a medal, you want a glowing medal, because why not, it's cool. So, the first thing you want to do is you want to go into body and then torso, and then all the way down here, you see this, these little characters, the XL and the XXL. You want to click the one with either the, the six arms or the four arms. Let's do four arms for simplicity's sake. Now, now you have here two extra arms. Uh, which are both twisted behind him. So let me just make these more visible for clarity's sake. Now these two arms, the first thing I would do is I would remove one of them because all we're going to do now is we're going to attach one metal. So let's remove this arm here. Oop, that one's gone. Now with this extra arm, we want to give him a metal, right? So we're going to search amulet. We're going to put this one on because it looks glowy and paladin with the colors that I had already put on it. And now what we need to do is we need to clip this into his body and make the metal fit over the chest. So how do we do that exactly? Well, it can be difficult, especially if the clavicles are pulled out. So right now this this arm is fairly far down because the extra arms are attached to the main arm. So if I pull the clavicle all the way out, you can see the extra arm follows, which means if I had this arm like this, then it would be nearly impossible to clip the extra arm into the body but right now that's not a problem so we pull this arm down like this and into the body and now you can see it fits fairly well in there it doesn't clip too much and then we're gonna pull the elbow up like this twist it a little further pull the elbow a little bit down and you see now it's just a question of getting the exact right specifics and we can also edit the hand so we can pull the hand down like this uh, the elbow a little up again, and then we can grab the actual amulet imposing up here and just twist that like that, and now we almost have it. And there we go, now we have an, am an amulet. That is So that is one example of what you can do with extra arms, but there is a lot more. So we have this here soldier unit, this is pretty old, so don't judge me on the quality, but you see this, this hand here, it's all plated and it's also got metallic fingers, but this one doesn't, so what can we do if we want that? And I'm, I'm pretending we only have single model now, so 
We can enable four arms to begin with. So now we have extra ones. We can disable one of them because we only want the one right now. And then with this one, now we just need to we need to match the posing from the main arm to the extra arm. Now, if you have pro, all you can do is you can go into the main arm and you can copy to other arms and it will adjust. However, we're going to assume that the viewer doesn't have pro. So instead, we're going to need to look at the numbers that show up when we twist these around. And I know that's kind of fiddly and annoying, but we're going to need to find out what those numbers are. And I know numerical slider input is also not available for non-pro, which is why you have to click these to find out the number. And then you need to, with those numbers, you just need to copy those over to the other one. And now that we've copied it all over, we probably also want to color this so that the clipped together arm that is identical actually has the same color. So let me quickly sort that. All right, so we have our clipped together arm here. And obviously this is a bit of a monstrosity, but now we go into gear or clothing rather, and we go into gloves and then we click this extra arm. Now this is one of the few areas where Hereforge allows you to have multiple pieces of clothing in the same section on one model. You can, for example, not have multiple chest pieces, but you can have multiple gloves. And now we're just going to scroll all the way down until we get to these, these scaly claws, and we're going to smack those on. And suddenly now we have a gauntlet with not just backhand protection here, we have actual finger gauntlets, you know, finger guard protection, you get the point. So let's say you've gone through the effort to actually clip two hands together, or we could even go further and do three, actually, in this case. So, as you can see, with three arms clipped together by enabling six arms in total, and having three of them on one side, we do not only have the option to stack multiple gloves, which we can do quickly here. As you can see, we have the fingerless glove, we have the wraps, and then we also have this wrist belt thing here. We don't only have the option to do that because we also have three weapons combined together. Th th this is one example of combining three weapons to make a fairly cool, decent, you know, albeit shoddy looking sword. But there's a lot more you can do with these kind of combinations. Like, for example, let us say we go into spears and we enable the simple boar spare. And then we go into the extra arms and we're still on... Let's go over to Axe, actually, and we enable these, and then I do the same thing on this hand, and and now with these three weapons that are all in the same hand, we pull them up and we twist them around like this, and we pull this one up as well, and suddenly we have this kind of halberd with a spear in the middle and an axe on both sides, and obviously this is not colored properly, but you get the point. By putting arms together like this and posing them into one another and then combining weapons, you can actually make custom weapons in Hero Forge, and believe me, the possibilities of that are just endless. Now, I will not spend much time on this part at all because, well, this video is not meant to be specifically for Pro, but how do you pose together two models? So, a lot of people, when they first get Pro, they feel it's kind of daunting to get into stacking two models, so I will quickly show you how you, how you do it. So, if you have a model like this, this, you have already posed it the way you want it to be and believe me you want to finish the posing before you do double model then you go into stage and you go into extra and then you click here import beta and then you just import the same model that you already have and once it is imported like this you need to pull them together so you pull it to the middle of the platform you take the extra model you twist it to zero from 17 it always starts on 17 for some reason and then you pull them together exactly and when it comes to this, an easy way, for me at least, tends to be to look at the ears, but I mean, you don't need to do that, like, you can absolutely figure it out without that, so, when they are both completely matched together, there we go, they are now as close as they're going to be, now there's obviously a lot of things you can do, but again, I won't go into too much detail, I mean, you can, for example, you can close the eyes now on a model, which is something you otherwise won't be able to do until face customizer comes out, so if you go into the extra model, and you remove the eyes, and you pose the eyelids around without having an eyeball now see you can close his eyes <laughs> making him look a, a little a little strange uh, and of course as as per usual you know you can change the clothing i could throw on something completely different underneath this characters and it just turn it will turn into a clippy mess but yeah you see like you can stack clothing pieces like this you know i have so many example builds of where i'm doing this i'm not gonna go into any more depth on it here yeah, if you don't have Pro, I, this is probably the main reason I would get it right now. And this will eventually become available for everyone, but not right now, sadly. 
So what about horn posing to create hair specifically? And I feel like this is a good example because it's very messy and it shows that you don't need to follow any exact rules with this. So I'm using a lot of horns here on two different models, right? So these extra strands, this hanging down here, here, and here, is basically, it is just using these horns here, the, uh, yeah, these sleek dragon horns. So if I take these off, yeah, you see, kind of goes away and like all it comes down to is if these models start off you know up here as per usual i will reset the posing so they start off looking like this right and then all you do is you color them like hair and then you just twist them down As you can see, it can be kind of fiddly. And then basically, you know, you pose them as you want them to be, and then suddenly it looks like hair. And another good one is this, which is the, uh, let me see if I can find it. It is, on, it is on the extra model. It is the, yeah, here, the curved horn. So applying one of these, and all you really need to do is you just twist this around. Again, you color it like hair. Then you twist it with some hairstyle down like this, and it kind of looks like this overhanging, like, messy little fringe bit. Of course, everything else is... Now, these these little spikes here, which is just this base horn. Yeah, these, the short crown horn, are really good for practice with horn hair because they're really simple. They're really small. You know, you can twist them into basically any hairstyle. So let's say we go back to, to this guy, right? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, he's still looking a bit stoned. Um, and then we, we, we feel like this hairstyle here, ah, oh, I mean, he's got gray hair now, so it's natural that he's got a receding hairline. But let's say let, let's say this is like Bill Clinton. He doesn't have a receding hairline, so we don't want him to have that. Then we can slap on two of these short curved horns, and then we're just gonna, we're gonna dislocate them so they're not posed separately. You do this by clicking this little option here, and then you twist these like this. You cover up that ugly receding hairline and i am allowed to call it ugly because i i have one of these myself in real life which means i'm allowed to make fun of it haha uh -huh, i will probably also be bald when i'm 50 years old and there we go now we just color these with the same color as the actual hair and boom now you don't really notice them anymore but what you do notice is that 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 receding hairline is gone so now the character looks kind of a bit younger and that's just a very very subtle thing you can do with horns for hair but obviously like you can make entire customized hairstyles just using horns if you really really want to Now, as for tail posing, I mean, it is very extensive, right? So I cannot go into full depth on it here, but I can go over the basics. So what it starts with is you need to go into body and then tail here, and then you see where it says tail count. You need to press a tail, and then after that, you can choose how many you want. And let, let's for now assume that all you want to do is you want to use the tail to hold an extra item. Then that's fair. Exactly as it is with the torso or the neck or anything else, you have... Well, this time you don't just have three, but you see, the in these numbers here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, etc. Yeah, on the cloak and on the torso and all that, there's usually only three of them. Uh, when it comes to the tail, there's 18, 19 even. So suffice to say, you have a lot of room for wiggle room. And you can see the further down you go, the further down you're adjusting the tail. So now I'm messing around with the 18 and the 19 and all I'm changing is the tip. And it's also worth noting that it is a little trick. The 14 is the last spot on the tail where it will impact the item you're holding. So 14 is very useful, a very useful number with the tail when you're holding something because that's the last one that will adjust this. And then after that point, you see, I can move around 15 however I want, but it no longer touches the item. And anything below 14, will of course also adjust it so really you just need to you, you need to take this step by step depending on how you want the tail to be so this is the base right this is the one that will change the whole because this is at number one so the entire tail will be edited based on what you do here so here is the bounty hunter i made for my star wars build and here's a good example of using a tail to just hold an item this dynamite stick here that is painted to look like a kind of sci-fi shoulder cannon is actually held by this tail so if i twist the tail back here in posing you see it just yeah it's uh, all all that goes away and if i just go back boom there you go the shoulder cannon returns 
Now, obviously, there is a lot more you can do with tails than just holding weapons, right? Like, the tails themselves can be used for, well, you know, you, you, you can use them for tails, obviously. But, you know, I, I'm gonna be honest, I don't do that very often. If I use tails, it's usually for something else, you know. If you slap on a bunch of these, for example, let's say you slap on this one and you make nine of them. Now, if you pose all of these into the legs here, you can kind of substitute a very large, fluffy... Victorian style dress and you know that's just one example of what you can of your, what you can do with tails so here's a fairly basic example right well yeah it's not exactly basic but this this is the swamp monster build that I made a while back and as you can see there's a lot of these tentacles sticking out here I've only used I've basically I've used this base straight tail and I've colored them to be slimy and disgusting to look like tendrils and then I've just kind of slowly twisted them around certain parts like you can see how this one is curling around this arm and you can see how this one is curling around this one and you, you can kind of see how they're slithering all around this character. And here I've also bent it very specifically in this hand to look like the, this swamp monster is holding on to one of these tendrils. And of course there's the tongue here that's meant to match with them as well. So so the nine tails have been removed and also one tail on the other model which was holding the shield up here. You see the difference here? All of these little tails add. And this, this again is just like this is not difficult to do. Anyone can do this because right now I'm not trying to shape them around something really specific. I'm not trying to create a dress or an item. I'm just moving tendrils around and curling them around certain limbs etc. So that's not complicated at all. But it would be a shoddy guide if I did not actually show show and practice how this was done. So we have here a model which has already kind of been doing it. As you can see, this model already has a bunch of tails wrapped around it in certain areas, but it also has tails that are just following behind her. So let's say we want one more of these tails to be wrapped around his body. So let's let's do that from the beginning. We find one of the tails back here, which has not yet been posed. So nope, not that one. Nope, not that one. There we go. Here, here we have one that has not been posed too much. So this one here, we are going to pose around this front leg here. So we start at the base. We want to pull it forward. We need to twist it in this direction so that it's kind of facing the leg we want it to go towards. Then we need to pull it closer with this next. So you see, we've kind of exhausted how close we can get it on with the, with the number one twisters. So now we need to move on to number two and get it closer. So you... Exactly, You're, it was this lowest one that is pulling it closer, so we can start with this one and I'm gonna pull it a little bit more upwards because I wanted to start above the knee. So now we have it touching the leg here. Now we need to kind of go down a little bit because we don't want it to immediately keep twisting so close to the base because then it will just go through the leg. So we scroll down a little bit, maybe to number 7 is a good spot. Yeah, and then we're gonna go down to number 8 after that. And you can kind of see we're getting close to the point where it's breaking off exactly where we want it to, which is like roughly here is where we want it to stop twisting, right? Or start twisting. So we are going to go down all the way to number 10. We're going to move from 10 to 11 and keep twisting it around like this. And then we move down to 12 because we've again exhausted how far we want to go on the number 10. And we just keep on twisting it down to 13. And we keep going. And you see exactly. So we keep on kind of twisting it downwards and around the leg at the same time using the lowest one and the middle one. So we just keep going now. We scroll down all the way to 15. So we're past 14 now. 14 would be the breaking point if this was holding an item. It would no longer be editing that item. So now we go down to 16. And you can see we're kind of getting to the point where it can almost no longer reach the boot. Because it's actually... Like, it's, it's only editing the very end of the tail, but that's fine. It doesn't need to touch the boot all the way around. But you can kind of see exactly so. So now it's beginning to get a little bit hard to see where the tail is because it's wrapped up in all these other tails. But now we are down at 19 and we can no longer edit it. So now we have a tail which goes all the way from down here around the leg. And this was where the hard twisting turn came, right? And that's because we skipped over several layers. Like, we edited on number one and number two and then we basically left it... Like as it was on default posing all the way until we reached like number 9, 10. Because that was when when the tail actually reached its breaking point. So you want to think of a tail as though it has multiple little lines in it. Like it has a line here, 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 a line here. And all of these lines are these numbers, right? So which one you edit is where it's going to start. So if I find another tail that's unedited, yeah, this one. So pay attention to this tail, right? If I ignore number one, which is the base up here, and I instead just go down to number, 
so say 14 or now we'll, we'll go at number 11 that's close to the middle and then we just twist it yeah you, you see that do you see how it just suddenly twists and turns here now that's because that's where number 11 is that's where the number 11 breaking point is and then you know all the other numbers are along the tail so it it it, it, def it definitely takes some practice to get this right but once you get it right it's it's gonna open a whole new world of possibilities. If you've made it all the way to the end, then thank you very much for watching. I hope that you found some of this useful. Uh, links to most of these models as well as the Discord link are in the description below. Also, I will make more advanced guides on specific areas, for, like for example tail posing in the future. So don't don't fret too much if you think that I skimmed over some of those areas too quickly in this video, because like I said, I, I can't go over it all now, but I will in the future. Now, if you like this video, please press like. If you dislike this video, then by all means press dislike and goodbye.